Today I'm going to show you how to take awesome city time lapses like this one. We're going to start here in the studio and I'll go over all of the settings. We'll then go out in the streets of Tokyo and I will show you how to set up. And finally, we'll come back here and work on the editing process together. And the best part of this is you don't need a fancy camera. I shot this whole thing on this little compact camera. It's the Sony ZV-1. So I promise you, no matter what you have, we can make it work. By the way, my name is Sean Payne and I make videos about how to be a filmmaker. If that's something that interests you, please subscribe and let's skip the rest of the intro BS and just get right into the settings. The first thing you need to understand about time lapses is that they are not initially a video. They are initially a series of photos, which you later edit to be a video sequence. So the first thing that you need to do is set your camera into the manual photo mode. Now, why manual? Well, like I said, you're taking a series of photos over time. Let's say you're taking a photo every second and you're in a downtown area of the city where there are lots of cars driving through and there are neon signs and stuff that are flashing. Well, every single second, that scene is going to be changing. So we wanna lock everything into manual so that we get a consistent exposure and a consistent white balance throughout the entire shooting process. Now, the next thing I recommend doing is setting your camera up in RAW and then choosing your image size. Normally for a video, your images are going to be 16 by nine, right? That's kind of the standard go-to video size. However, on most cameras with your photo mode, 3.2 is going to be the standard size. So you have to choose between these two. If you want to, you can use 16.9 and set your camera up perfectly when you're in the scene and shoot that way, and that's fine. It'll be a little bit easier to get into your editing software at the end of the day and just go from there. However, if you set it in 3.2, you're going to get more resolution. And what that's going to mean is that you're going to be able to crop in later, you're going to be able to pan your 16.9 frame across that image. You could pan up or down, left to right, zoom in, zoom out, and add another degree of motion into your shot, which is really cool. So I definitely recommend leaving it in 3.2 if you're going to be comfortable working with that later on. For your aperture, I'd recommend choosing a value in between f8 and f11. This is going to give you the maximum depth of field, making sure everything's in focus, and it's also going to let in less light, which is actually a good thing in this case, because our shutter speed is going to be very slow, and so that's going to let in a lot of light. So the two things are gonna balance out. Now, speaking of your shutter speed, I would recommend going for a value of around 1 8th of a second. I've found that to be a generally good value to get nice motion blur in the shot. Of course, you can play with these settings and change them around, but this is a good starting point for you. One thing to keep in mind with your shutter speed is if you're taking a photo, for example, every one second, you need your shutter speed to be faster than that or you're going to have problems. So you can't choose like a shutter speed of two seconds if you're taking a photo every second. It's just, it's not gonna work, don't do that. Moving on to the ISO, I would set this value as low as possible while still maintaining a good exposure. So don't feel like you have to keep your ISO super, super low just because you've been told that high ISO is bad. On the little Sony ZV-1, this only has a one inch sensor, so it doesn't let in that much light but I still found at ISO 1000 that the image looked totally awesome and there was very, very little noise. So don't be afraid to push that up if you need to, um, but definitely try to keep it on the lower end if you can. You can always slow your shutter speed down a little bit to let in more light. And for the white balance, I recommend sticking it in any mode other than auto. I usually stick mine in daylight. It really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're going to take that into editing and balance it out later. Now, the last thing we need to do for settings is to set it into the interval shooting mode, which may be called something slightly different. Just look for the word interval on your camera and that will probably be what you need. Now guys, I have some very, very bad news. We have to do some math. No, don't run, don't click off the video. I promise it's gonna be okay. We will get through this together. And it's actually pretty easy. So cameras have three frame rates that they'll usually film in, 24p, 30p and 60p and you're in product you have to choose one of these so whatever other video you're shooting if you're shooting that in 24p you're gonna have to take a certain number of photos with your camera in order to get one second of video at the end 
and that number actually happens to be exactly the same as the frame rate. So really the only math we have to do is one equals one, which is pretty easy, right? I, I hope, I really hope that's easy to understand. But if you want one second of video and you're shooting in 24p, you need 24 photos. If you want one second of video and you're shooting in 60p, you need to take 60 photos. So from there, you basically just need to figure out, well, you know, I wanna shoot 10 seconds of video and I'm shooting in 60p. So I know I need 60 photos for one second. So if I want 10 seconds, I need 600 photos. And then you know how many photos you need to take in your time-lapse in order to get the length of the time-lapse that you need for your final video. It's good to figure these things out ahead of time because you wanna know how many seconds of video you're gonna get out of your shooting. If for some reason I didn't explain that very well and I made one equals one turn into difficult math, please let me know in the comments and I will be happy to elaborate a little bit more. All right, so I'm down here in Shinjuku, Tokyo, and I'm at a fairly famous location where we're going to take our first time lapse. Now, before I even set up my tripod, I'm gonna be thinking about composition with just the camera because it's much easier to move around and change your scene when you're not having to completely relocate a tripod and rebalance everything. So I'm gonna do that now, and then we'll get this time lapse set up. Now, one thing I'm noticing is that right down here, we have a bar that's separating the two roads. And so I'm gonna go for a very flat composition and that bar needs to be aligned perfectly in the center with my camera. That's the composition I'm gonna go for. Obviously you can get as creative as you want, but we're gonna keep this simple today just to demonstrate this topic. All right, so I'm just getting my composition dialed in here and zooming in a bit. All I have to do, I've already got all of the settings set up and ready to go that I showed you from the studio. So now we're just gonna set the interval timer. We're gonna hit go and it's gonna do everything for us. All right, all we have to do now is take our photos and turn them into a video sequence. I'm going to be using Adobe Lightroom and Premiere Pro. You can use any photo editing and video editing software that you want, but you'll just have to apply the general idea of what I'm doing to your situation. Okay, so once you have all of your photos loaded into your computer, you're going to go down to the bottom left of Lightroom and hit the import button. Once you're in this area, you look for the folder that you have all of your photos in and you hit the import button at the bottom right and that's going to bring in all of your photos. Once you have all of your photos loaded into Lightroom, take a look at the bottom and just make sure that the sorting is done by capture time so that these are going to be in the correct order for your time lapse. Click on your first photo and go to the develop tab. Make any sort of color or contrast changes that you want to as the default is probably not going to be the look that you're going to want for your final images. Once you're happy with the coloring and the contrast that you've done, go down to the bottom left and hit copy and you can check whatever settings you want. I'm gonna go ahead and copy pretty much everything. Go back to the library and unclick from that photo and you still have tons and tons of photos that don't have any coloring done. Click on the second photo Scroll down all the way until you get to your last one. Hold shift and click again and it will select every photo from the second photo down to the last photo. You can then right click on the second photo, scroll down to develop settings and go into paste settings. This is going to copy over the settings into every single photo in this folder and this might take a while so let's skip forward. Once the color is copied over to all of the photos, go ahead and click the first photo, scroll down, hold shift and click the last photo and go up to the top left and go to file export. Now we're going to export these photos and what we wanna do is change the file setting to a JPEG and set the quality to 100% with the sRGB color space. You should save this into a folder that makes it easy to find for you and click export. Now that all of the photos have been exported, we need to get them into a video in Premiere Pro. In order to do this, you go up to File, down to Import, and find your folder. Once you have your folder open with all of your photos, this is a very important step. Only click on the first photo in the folder. Do not try to shift click all of the images. Go down here where that says Image Sequence and make sure that this box is checked. 
Again, if you try to highlight more than one image, this is not going to work. So just get the first one, check image sequence, and then hit open. And this is automatically going to pull this in as a time lapse for you. One important thing to understand about Premiere is that it copies whatever settings are on the first clip into the timeline settings. So if I drag this clip that I shot in my studio, this is a 1920 by 1080 file. And if I go to the top left to the sequence menu and hit sequence settings, I can see it's 24 frames per second, 1920 by 1080, which is exactly what I want. When I go to copy in my time lapse, it's now going to be fit into this 1920 by 1080 box and it's going to be in 24 frames per second. Now, if I need to resize this because it's very zoomed in, I can go into the effect controls panel and I can scale that back and reposition as needed. Now, if on the other hand, the first thing you do is drag in the time lapse, it's going to be in a 3-2 aspect ratio. And if I go to back to sequence sequence settings, now it's in about 29, 30 frames per second and the frame size is all screwed up. I can edit that in the sequence menu, but I find it much easier if you start from blank timeline and load in some footage that's already the right format so that when you drop in your time lapse, it is already in the correct settings and you can scale quickly and move on from there. And now this is totally ready to go. You've done it, you've made a time lapse. Give this video a big thumbs up if this was helpful for you and consider subscribing if you want to learn more about filmmaking. Catch you next time, peace.